Hi, welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers. My name's Mark Owen, and each week I invite a panel of business experts to review the morning newspapers, find out what's happening in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. But before I start, I'd just like to thank our fantastic sponsors, Hazelwood's accountants and business advisors, who have just renewed their contract with us for another year. Woohoo! Thank you ever so much for them, because we couldn't do the show without them. Okay, let's meet the gang. We've got this week, we've got Jason Ivey. He's the new MD of Gloucestershire Airport. And it's fair to say that the airport's had a bit of turbulence, but Jason's in the driving seat and he's taking it forward. The, the airport itself is, uh, what is it, 13th in the country with the most busiest 68,000 flights last year. And we we'll catch up to him with him to find out what's going on. We've got Il Will Abbott is a partner of Sheridan based Randall and Payne. He's a strategic accountant and business advisor, and he's well known for his series of business workshops as well. So welcome, Will. We've got Rupert Walters. He wears lots of hats as our Rupert. He's the chair of the Race and Equality Commission. He's the director of 42 Limited, a trustee of the Music Works, and he's also a director of Murraway House. So we'll find out all about that. And finally, last not but least, we've got Gillian Appleby. She is a CEO of Gloucestershire Rape and Sexual Abuse, and we'll find out about the amazing work. And sadly, she's as busy as ever. Huge demand dealing with over 900 cases last year. But on the good side, it's actually their birthday as well. And they're celebrating 40 years. So we'll find about that. We'll give them a free plug as well. Thank so you. before we start, let's have a quick gander at the newspapers, courtesy of the BBC. So we'll start off with The Guardian. Here's a, the, body, the Guardian. The Guardian. <laughs> Biden demands Gaza ceasefire's strongest rebuke to Israel. The Daily Telegraph, Biden tells Israel stop killing civilians. The I, Sunak urged to publish legal advice on arms sales to Israel. The Times, senior Tory, I gave MPs numbers to honey trap. The Daily, the Daily Mail, top Tory, I gave MPs numbers to sexting plotter. The Daily Express, make no mistake, Migrant flights to take off soon. The Financial Times. Chinese state bank hold key role in future Thames water. The Mirror. Justice is the name for Sharon. The Metro. Tied up and trapped in the river. Dead soldier wrote riddle revealed. The Sun is G'day from Charles as he's going down under soon. And the Daily Star. What time is it on the moon? NASA ordered to answer the question that nobody knew we needed. It's true. I wonder what time it is on the moon at the moment. Anyway, OK, let's get on with the show, as you say. How do I stop sharing this? It's not stopping me. There we go. OK, let's start with you, Will. What have we picked out from the papers, please, sir? Well, Mark, I was flicking through the papers like I do. You know, I like to find the, find the stories that seem to relate. And the first one that caught my eye when I got to the business section was um, in the Times. Um, worst run for retail since COVID, which is a bit of a downer. Then you flip the page over and it says the service sector recovery fades unexpectedly. Um, slower wage growth raises hopes of rate cuts, which I think um, those stories are kind of uh, reinforcing what I'm seeing working with businesses locally is there definitely are some headwinds out there in the UK and in Gloucestershire. We're seeing more, um, particularly around cash flow. I think that's always a clue when, when businesses cash flow starts to slow down. That's a, that's a really early indicator there's some issues out there. We've done more cash flow lending for businesses in the last three months than I probably did for the whole of last year. So that's interesting. Um, and then you turn the page again and you see this. This is a good picture for you, isn't it? Look, the massive bull market in the US. So all the UK investors are now investing in the US because the US is doing really well. And then there's another story about US firms offshoring white collar jobs to the UK, which is I think is really interesting because um, apparently we're quite cheap in the UK compared to the US. Um, so that's an interesting development. And again, we are seeing, you know, another side of the business where we're doing transactional stuff, business owners exiting the business. There is definitely a lot of interest from U.S. investors in good um, U.K. businesses. And I guess as U.K. companies, we're used to offshoring to the Philippines and India. We do some of that ourselves. So it's really interesting to, sit, you know, be on the other end of the stick, if you like. Actually, we've got U.S. firms coming in, trying to attract our, our best talent. And retention and attraction of people for most of the businesses I work with has been a challenge, you know, for some years. So there's a shortage of people. We really don't need the US people poaching them and paying them better salaries as well. So that's an interesting one. Um, I did something I've never, ever done before in my life, Mark, just to keep you happy. I bought a copy of the Daily Mail. 
<laughs> and uh, and it's gone up. Just ten, through ten, that, by the way, I, just want to say, I'm I'm pleased to say I got to page sixty nine when I actually found a new story. <laughs> There's an awful lot of stuff in the Daily Mail. I have to say, a lot of opinion pieces. This is where people get their information from, right? The one that caught my eye, I have to say, scandal over tax leaks threatens to engulf PwC. And this is the whole thing about um, sharing government secrets on work they were doing with the Australian government, and they were sharing it with the rest of the PwC around the world, trying to take advantage of the tax planning before the tax laws were even in place. Um, it just reminded me about R and D. So I think one of the one of the challenges for us as a profession is when we get rogue advisors come along take their fee and um, do all sorts of things and then disappear over the horizon and then leave the clients to pick up the mess with the revenue afterwards and we're certainly seeing a huge increase in r d inquiries from the revenue um as a result of spurious claims so it's all a bit doom and gloom really in one sense but I, i'm very positive actually i think there are some headwinds out there but generally speaking um it's not a storm it's just some headwinds and it's you know it's election year right so confidence is always a little bit down people are always a little bit nervous about what's going to happen and i think they just just delay making decisions and that then has an impact but overall i think people are busy they're looking to sell looking to exit looking to retire so there's plenty going on on that side people are recognizing issues going to the banks borrowing money getting investment in and all those things so actually people are responding positively to the challenges that they face that's what i see Okay, thanks so much for that. Well, a great uh, critique of the papers that you got. And I like the fact that I managed to squeeze a £1.10 out of you for the Daily Mail. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's go over to Gillian. Gillian, great to have you back on the show again. Lovely to see you. Thanks. Uh, you Thank you for the University. invite. It's all right. You're in the University of Gloucestershire business building there today. But what have you picked out from us from the papers, please? Um, so I... I was also out early this morning trying to find somewhere who had their stock of uh, uh, today's papers in ready. But anyway, I picked up the the Daily Telegraph and the Eye. But I've just I've, a couple of pieces I've I've picked out from the um, Daily Telegraph that I thought were were interesting to me. Anyway, one of the uh, headlines was about men working from home um, risk no promotion, and it was an interesting article about who men were, who work purely from home are more likely to get overlooked for promotion and pay rises than women who work purely at home. And plus, um, bosses were 15% less likely to promote men who work from home full-time compared to their peers. So I just find that interesting in, in the post-COVID times, but also more so um, because as from tomorrow, there's the new regulations around flexible working, um, which we're all going to have to consider as employers, um, whereby people can ask for changes. We need to you know, respond within a set time um, and to make the business work. So I also found it quite interesting being a woman that for once men might be worse off than women and in some element. So there was that one. Well, and I, then... I might, uh, just quickly, I might promote myself now. Uh, just Go on, you then. Know, because, because I can. Because nobody else myself. will. <laughs> I might make myself president president of uh, Punchline for now. Anyway, sorry, Karen. Um, and then the other one was actually um, an article that's titled Prince Andrew was sexy and heroic once upon a time, says Hawes. And so and this is about Keeley Hawes, who played his um, private secretary, Prince Andrew's private secretary, in the Netflix film Scoop. And I guess the, the paragraph that sticks out for me is um, because she says... Um, but actually, it's the same for me. When I was growing up during that period, we celebrated those men, Bill Wyman and his teenage bride, uh, Randy Andy in his military suit. They were all sexy and it sounds disgusting now to say it, but it was heroic. And that's absolutely true. And that, I suppose trying to explain to my teenage sons just how times have changed and what was acceptable and just wasn't into now. And and I guess we see that and it's, and it's good, <laughs> but we see that coming through in terms of um, the cases that we see. Um, and um, the strength of the young women um, coming through uh, Gloucestershire rape and sexual abuse. So those were my two bits. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to that very shortly. So let's go Thank to you, Rick. What, what have you picked out from us today? And hopefully you found it a bit easier getting the papers. Oh, I did. It's, uh, yeah, much more accessible here. But I've gone for the Daily Mail today. So, um, and I picked out some funnies out of the Daily Mail for myself. So one of the things, don't listen to Dolly. Nine, nine to five is good for you. So um, scientists have analysed data of more than 7,000 workers, and they say that um, the employment patterns in the younger adults were linked to later sleep, physical or mental health issues, compared to individuals who mostly worked during traditional hours. So what they're saying is that, you know, if you maintain a nine to five 
um, kind of working hours when you're younger and then switch to a more volatile working pattern when you get late into your 30s and 50s. It's a lot better for your physical and mental health. You have better sleep and um, all the good things uh, that come with physical health, which is really interesting because, of course, most of us try to fight against the nine to five kind of constraints, don't they? And, the, and you know, I was only speaking to my partner the other day and saying, actually, you know, when I started work in my 20s, there was so much more to do. You know, there was photocopying and sending stuff and putting stamps on things and all of that. So actually, if you if you think of what we now do in our days, we send emails and we have AI to help us do all sorts of jobs that were just manual. The working day really should be a lot shorter, shouldn't it? So actually, yeah, we'll we'll see how that ends up. But well, as we get to yeah. our 50s, we need that, Mark. But don't we all just cram in more, though? You know, the, the, the quicker that everything comes comes or, or becomes, we just do more and more and more of it. I, I, I'm a great believer that we're all working longer, harder for less. Yeah. Uh, because also people re expect a response much sooner as well. That's, that's exactly right. And, of course, we can all shout at each other a lot easier as well, which yeah. I get a lot of letters, or, uh, obviously. With so we're doing more in the nine to five than, than we used to do. Um way back when we were much younger but rupert you run your own business as well but so do you actually still work nine to five or do you work a lot longer than that i i i, I well i am in the habit of getting to work and at my desk for about quarter to nine which i always have done in in um you know corporate life and then i don't like to leave before five thirty, and that's just a habit but the reality of running your own business actually you, you work much longer, don't you? you know, you're thinking about it on the weekends. Even when you go home, you don't switch off. So whilst you may not be physically at your desk or in the work environment, you are actually working in your mind. So, yeah, it is longer. Yeah, no, we've actually uh, I never, I have terrible trouble switching off, but that's just me, I suppose. Yeah. And the other story that I picked out, Mark, sorry to interrupt you, and I, th I found this was really interesting. Um, unexpected badger in the bagging area. Um, so this is all about barcodes. Uh, so this is the 50th anniversary of barcodes um, that we're in uh, this year. And I found that quite interesting because actually I started my career in retail um, and I still actually have a, a love for retail and and all of that shopping and experience. Um, I used to sell suits, suits. I used to sell suits for a living. That, that was my first uh, job. Um, and, that, and actually later on in life, I went on to look after Tesco's uh, big retailer. Um, so, yeah, barcodes, this grabbed my attention. So um, the first product which was ever barcode was a packet of Wrigley's Juicy Fruits Gum. Um, and it was first scanned in the small Ohio town of Troy, which brings something to the Trojan horse. So I suppose there's two things there. Um, just a few more. And there's a top 10, but I'll just go through a few of these. Many roads and towns uh, are now barcoded. Uh, but people mistake them for zebra crossings, so they can easily be identified from the sky, which is, who'd, who'd think, very, very interesting. Um, and then the pinstripe suit was invented as a result of um, a failed attempt at barcoding. Will, that, that, that'll um, resonate with you as an accountant, I'm sure, back in the day when we all, they were all wearing pinstripe suits and uh, mm -hmm. looking very professional and intimidating as an accountant. And finally, now this is the funniest one, and I'm, we're all aligned to this one. Um, it, it, it's about self-checkout. So fearing that customers might find it too easy to operate the self-checkout service, supermarket bosses have made one in 10 items unreadable at, uh, at the checkout. And so they go on to say that every 10th item at the manufacturers to include a barcode, that was very hard to scan. Um, and they said that the customers love this level of inconvenience and, and they were planning to roll out more. I know you're shaking your head, Jill, because what? when you're in a hurry, it, 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 it's it's embarrassing. <laughs> not, yeah. Not, yeah. Um, yeah, so they're planning to run out more hazardous as, hazardous interruptions to our self-scanning habits as soon as possible. So I thought that was really funny. I, I, don't, I don't get that, but I'm oh. going to leave it there for a second. I'm going to go to you because we, we won't have time otherwise. Jason, well, thanks ever so much for that, Rupert. Jason, welcome to the show. Great to see you again. Uh, last time I saw you, actually, we did a little video together down at the airport. Yes, yeah, so, uh, I'm still getting a rib for that, for not being able to open the door first time around. Do you remember? <laughs> yes, yeah. 
<laughs> um, can you tell us, please, what have you picked out for the papers? Uh, okay, so I've gone for the uh, the Daily Telegraph this morning, and like Gillian, fourth attempt with the news agents this morning. Um, so I'm going with the police theme. So the first one, I think you've already flagged up in one of your, uh, your headlines, might have been The Guardian. Um, do you remember PC Sharon Beshinovsky? Besh she was brutally yeah. shot and killed in Bradford, 2005. Um, anyway, three people were convicted in 2006, and they, they finally uh, found the uh, ringmaster guilty yesterday. After 20 years, right? I think he fled to Pakistan and they, they've extradited him. Um, I think what was particularly, you know, because she was she was a, a mum of three, she was killed on her fourth of fourth daughter's birthday, which is, you know, I mean, no killing is any, any good, but that particularly resonated. But a good sort of story there for you, you can run, but you can't hide. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a celebration, but uh, justice was served. So, um, yeah, sort of a point on that. Uh, I'm staying with the police theme. Um, burglaries on average, take 20 hours to respond to in the UK, which, I don't know, call me old-fashioned, but when you ring 99, you, you expect you expect the police to sort of turn up uh, PPDQ, but uh, I think one of, the, one of the forces, Northamptonshire, was 28 hours, so that's the next day, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit of a touch, that feels, uh, uh, it's quite a long time, but um, yeah, there we go. Well, it's nothing worse than actually, I mean, we've been burgled three times over the over the time that uh yeah. not uh, only once at the time I, I lived here with someone actually managed to get in through the front door kick it in and um run around the house and stole a uh, an ipad uh thankfully we don't have very much of value obviously in this house i'm probably very <laughs> disappointed with his ipad but there you go it was cracked anyway uh but the other time the other time the, it, the, the trouble is the second time we got burgled in a in a in, a, in our first house my wife and i it actually made us move house because we didn't feel safe in it. I didn't yeah, yeah. feel the girls were safe in it. And it was a big driving factor. And I think this is the thing about it. The police don't react to something like this. We, it makes us feel less safe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. I, I had a motorcycle stolen a couple of years back and the, the police turned up and said, basically, you know, forget it, you'll never get that back. Sort of it yourself, which is, uh, I don't know it's indicative of the police being understaffed or misallocation of resources, but it's, uh, it is what it is. Maybe well, the trouble is they don't solve a lot of crimes anymore. That's the biggest problem, you know. Not like, um, or it appears to be that they don't solve a lot of crime, crimes anymore. It's the same with shoplifting, you know. The, the the amount of shoplifting that goes on in this country nowadays is actually really quite frightening. Now, there's a big report in the co-op, actually, today saying they've got £70 million pounds yeah. oh, stolen wow. from shoplifting. Terrible, terrible. Yeah. Well, thanks ever so much for that, Jason. OK, we're, we're going to go over to you, back over to you, Will. Um, and um, uh, about your work at Randall and Payne, and obviously, can you tell us about a bit about these workshops that you do, mate. Yeah, so the, I mean, the workshops are an element of what I do. Um, I do a lot of um, coaching and mentoring NED type roles with businesses now. And um, one of the things we like to do is get people together, you know, once a quarter at least, um, with the peer workshops. So they run on a regular basis, boot camps as I call them. And, and um, we usually got 12, 14 people in the room. And it's a bit of uh, coaching and development learning stuff there, but but it's mostly it's about sharing amongst ourselves and what other people are doing. And I think I think that's the that's the part of the workshop that people really enjoy from from those workshops anyway. In terms of hearing that other business owners and are facing the same challenges or overcome the same things, and actually we're all in this together kind of thing. But it's um because it can be a lonely place, right? as you know, Mark. We know running the business, it can be a lonely place at times. And it's good to go and talk to other business owners and share, you know, share some of the stories and things that are going on and some of the successes. Um, but we do a few other workshops as well. We do the five behaviours of a cohesive team is one of the things that we do. Um, and then just sense what people what people need. If there's something they need around sales or leadership, um, coaching their own teams, then we'll, we, you know, we'll do that. Um, we'll do that as well. Everything disc. Uh, profiling we do which is again which is a really useful tool for people you know particularly somebody mentioned relationships you know it's important um we try and help our people you know realize their full potential as i said there's there's challenges around recruitment there's not enough people in the country to do all the jobs frankly so we need to make sure that we're productive and people are happy and want to stay and, and you know having a good day really so that's a lot of what i do is around that what's what's the biggest thing the mds that tell you is their biggest problem then at the moment well, i think i can come back to recruitment would be one of the things i mean i mentioned earlier that cash is getting a bit tight and that's you know people need to keep an eye on their customers and are they paying and because once it starts in one place it, you know it creeps out and, and flows everywhere else but recruitment's been an issue for for as long as i can remember um you know and, and his, 
reality is there's a million plus vacancies, isn't there? So when I pick up the paper and re you know read about the US or look into uh, subcontract and outsource to the UK as well and use that talent, that's going to drive salary and wages up. So there, I think there is a um, it's a bit of an employee's market. It has been for a while. I think it's swinging back a little bit towards the employer now. But yeah, I, I would say recruitment typically is, is the issue. Finding the right skills and the talent. The world's changing. The skills that we need are changing. As you know, I am uh, get a plug in for Gloucestershire College. I'm chair of governors at Gloucestershire College as well. And we're having to change what we deliver and the courses that we deliver. But we produce a lot of wonderful talent for you know Gloucestershire businesses through the college. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say that was the biggest challenge still. Okay. All right. Thanks ever so much for that. Well, Joe, we'll go over to you now, Gillian. So obviously, can, if you could just give us an overview of the, of the work that you do, because obviously I'm a great, great uh, supporter of the charity. And um, yeah, it's, it's just amazing. So do you want to give everybody just a quick overview? Yeah, it's saying it's, it's never lighthearted conversation, is it, to say that you're, uh, you're CEO of a rape crisis centre. But um, but that, you know, there are some highlights and we do some great work and um, and there are some great, great outcomes for the people that we support. But so Grassac has been um, it's our it's our 40th birthdays, as you said, Mark, this year, which I find a little daunting since the barcode has been here longer than um, supporting women um, and girls in across Gloucestershire in terms of rape and abuse. But anyway, there we go. And, um, and we've grown over the years, um, it, you know, as most rape crisis centres started as a as a phone um, in a cupboard, a glorified cupboard, um, you know, somewhere uh, with some you know, women, cooperative of women volunteers. However, we now employ um, 20 women uh, working for, for Grassac. Um, and we apply for grants and trust funds and, um, and we're funded also by Gloucestershire OPCC. Um, they also um, give us money each year. But what, what we do is support um, I say we've been supporting women and girls for the last 40 years, um, but as of 2022, we now support all genders. So we were aware that there's nowhere else for, you know, men and boys to go or or transgender people. So, you know, anybody who needs help will be there now. And and I find it confronting. I think probably the youngest um, person that, and their family that we're supporting at the moment is a preschooler um, who's experienced sexual abuse and the oldest person um, would be in their 80s. And, and it doesn't matter when that's happened. It doesn't matter whether it's historical. Somebody else I can think of that were helping at the moment, they were abused as a child and they're now retired. You, and they've carried that, that shame, that burden, that um, you know, agony uh, and that you know, judgment. Um, and in very many cases, wrongly so, but, but guilt, because that's how, um, that's how it affects people. Um, they've carried that through their life and that, that has complete repercussions. So. Um, I suppose my role since I've I've come to join Grassac um, in the last fifteen months was was certainly not to normalise um, rape and sexual abuse, but to normalise the conversation. Um, as I've bored you before, Mark, um, you know the stats are horrendous. If you think of one in four women um, as adults are sexually assaulted or abused, um, one in eighteen men are uh, raped or sexually abused as an adult, and one in four, six children are. Um, are abu sexually abused. I mean, you know, the stats are horrendous. And um, and it's not all about, you know, going out and stranger danger. Yes, that does happen. But the vast majority of rapes happen from somebody that you know, or it could be um, one in three are, or one in two are an ex-partner or a partner. Um, and one in three um, rapes happen in the home. Six out of seven are from somebody that you know. So, you know, it's, it's there everywhere. And so I suppose my I've taken upon myself to try and make the, the conversation um, and to normalize the conversation about rape and sexual abuse because because silence isn't, you know, isn't a solution. It's not a it's you know, it's no way of dealing with it anyway. So we support um, people who choose to go through the criminal justice system um, and they're supported by by an ISFA, an independent sexual violence advisor. Um, that is a recognised post. If you listen to Channel Four or Radio Four, even um, you know you'll hear ministers talking about um, about ISFAs because um, the Home Office and the Ministry of Justice have, have put a lot of money um, across the country into um, ISFAs, and they will work with people who have reported to the um, and want reported to the police and want to go through the criminal justice system, um, and then we will advocate for them, we will support them, and if you bear in mind that in 
in Gloucestershire, on average, it'll take three, three and a half years for a case to get to court after it's been reported. And we have cases, people that we're working with, five years and they're still waiting to get their day in court. So they can't heal, they can't move forward, they have to keep really living the trauma. And um, our ISFAs are the people who are consistent. They work um, and communicate with the police, um, they support that person, they may signpost them to mental health support, they may need housing support, they may need some practical support. And, and an ISFA is with them there, all the way through the one consistent person. So that's that side. And then um, the other side is in terms of emotional support. So people who um, are looking to explore um, what's happened to them to try and heal, to understand the impact it has upon their their lives. And that's a that's 20, a 20 week program face to face with your specialist support worker. Um, and it's a really safe space in which to explore. There's no judgment. We believe everyone. We support everyone. Um, and. And I suppose above all is kindness and allowing people that space to speak in a confidential space. And the number of times we get feedback from clients saying, you basically saved my life. You, you enabled me a safe space to tell things I've never told anyone before with no judgment. It's, it's huge. So as you said before, over 900 clients that we supported last year, 649 adults and two, 600, um, 260 children. So it's big. Wow, it's huge. And when you actually break down the numbers like that, it's really frightening. And uh, thanks Yeah, so much it is. For, no, thank, thanks, thanks so for giving me the opportunity. No worries. I'm going to actually invite you back for a big interview as well. I think it's such a... Uh, I think it'd be, it'd be lovely to get you back on a different show and talk about it in, in, in more detail, if that's OK. Because we only have a limited time here, but thanks ever so much for that, I think. Uh, we'll thank you, because I'm very passionate about the work that we do. And I just want to say, I don't own Grassac. I'm not the CEO, I'm just the CEO but I still think about it seven days a week, about 18 hours a day. So you don't you don't have to just be a business owner to never stop thinking. No, no, that's very true. No, how the hell do you switch off with something like that when you yeah. try to help so many people? Uh, Rupert, I'm going to go back over to you, please. Uh, tell us about uh, 42, because I don't know very much about it. I've bumped into you so many times over the years at different business breakfasts, and we always, always have our little chats and stuff. But tell us about the company, please. How long have we been going? 19 years um yeah so it's quite and actually it's called 42 because i started it when i was 42 so if you do the numbers you'll know how old i am now so and then actually it's quite funny and i started i called it 42 and in the early days people used to say to me oh um is it because of hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy because 42 is the meaning the meaning to life i thought like, no but i'll take it because actually if that helps you to remember me that's 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 brilliant so I started it. Um, it was all around building relationships. So, so that's what I left my kind of full-time job. That's what I was doing. I was a service director. And I thought, actually, I could do this very well in the um, SME kind of arena. So that's why I left um, to do that. And actually, you know, 19 years ago, that was really hard because, you know, most SMEs will say, actually, we can do that job very well ourselves. Why would we need to employ somebody else to do that? So... But actually, it was really good because that led me to kind of pivot into actually, well, if this isn't good, well, what else I can do? And, and the building relationships is really the core because what it helps you to do is to get involved in lots of other things that may not have been core to the building relationship, but making relationships with other people, you then get involved in a whole range of things. So when you say I wear many hats, that, that's quite true, but actually it's many hats with one core purpose. And that core purpose is um engaging in um trying to make change and delivering impact that hopefully changes some of the uh, behavior and community and all the things that that, that we suffer with in society now you... so over that time you know i've been involved as you said chaired the race and equality commission uh for gloucester and gloucester as, uh, as a whole um uh owned a um domiciliary care um company um and so my main kind of driver is around that social impact space. You know, how can what I do help in in that space? Um, and then, of course, Moray House, um, which is, um, you know, we came up with the idea that actually uh, the charity sector needed somewhere to come together as a whole and operate and learn from each other and be around each other 
and um, you know do some great works. And so we came up with Moray House, and that's been going now for five years. Can you believe it? This is, we, we, we're in our fifth year. It's based in the center of um, Gloucester, and we've had lots of organizations start with us and grow into bigger organizations. You know, they started as quite small. Night Stop's an example of that. We provide a great service for uh, young people. And, you know, they started with a couple of offices and now they're in um, a nice big building because, you know, they're able to uh, professionalize and, you know, kind of hone that kind of proposition that they had. So Moraway House um, is one of the great uh, outputs of the work that, that I do and um, continue to do. And, you know, working with other organizations and business owners and initiatives uh, throughout the city, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, it, it kind of, you know, that's what I'm about. And that's what 42 is about, really. Okay. Thanks. Thanks ever so much for that. And you are right. Murray House is, is an amazing, amazing place. People just don't realize it, really. It's just a stone's throw away from the transportation hub in Gloucester. Used to be Burma Solicitors, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Um, uh, I can't remember the name now. Anyway. Probably Morris. <laughs> so and they went to Taintons. And Taintons as well. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for that, Rupert. Okay, Jason, great, uh, great to have you on the show. Tell us about the Gloucester Airport now, because you took over a, 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 around a year ago, wasn't it, as Intrim MD? Uh, it had its fair share of problems, but this, we don't have to, we don't have to go over that again. But what's your year has been like, and what's been the most sort of difficult challenge of running a, an airport like that? Because it's massive, isn't it, for a start, the, the area you cover. It is, it is. So yeah, been in post since uh, since end of July. So. Um... Oh gosh, where do you start? So I'm responsible for pretty much everything that goes on. Business development, regulatory compliance. So we had a, quite a bit of work to do with uh, addressing some regulatory issues. There's obviously uh, building relationships back with the staff. Mark, I think it's, it's you, you documented quite well that, that the relations with the tenants weren't uh, exactly tickety-boo. So uh, a lot of effort has gone into um, working with our, sort of our based operators and, and staff. So that's taken a, a large part of it. And then sort of three or four months into my tenure, the news broke about uh, the council's desire to, to sell the airport. And that, that's well underway. So a little bit of an update there. So I can tell you that uh, Savills have been appointed as our sales agent and corporate finance advisor. And they're working closely with us now to um, effectively go to market. So we're, we're anticipating end of June, something like that where you know the, the glossy brochure effectively gets, gets produced. Um, and we've sort of got a target date at the end of March next year sort of allowing for all the due diligence to be done. Uh, we've got quite a bit of interest already. So we have a few NDAs signed to date. Some airport operators, um, there's some airline related people or aviation related people, uh, property developers, that type of stuff. But uh, it's, you know, it's, it's early days at the moment. And all of those will go through a first level sift before, uh, before, we, before we progress. How many how many businesses are actually on the business park itself? Because it's quite it's quite diverse, isn't it? As well, it, honestly, it's it's huge. It really is. I, I can't recall the numbers. I'm embarrassed to say I should, I should know that, but it's significant numbers of uh, businesses. I think it sort of directly or indirectly employs somewhere between two and a half to three thousand people. Um, yeah, it really is a, a diverse uh, a diverse centre, and that's something we've been aware of. And, and also, you're responsible for those planes taking on and off. All, all the time as well, not only just running the business park, but all, yeah. all that air traffic control stuff going on as well. Yeah, it, it, it's, 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 I guess it's easy to sort of um, to think sort of Gloucester Airport being sort of uh, pretty low key, but from an air traffic point of view, um, the controllers there they are probably the busiest controllers in the UK. They, they really are because we've got a we've got two runways, we've got a mixed mode, we've got business jets, flying training, which probably make up most of the numbers we spoke about, and then we have our maintenance, repair and overhaul, so engineering effectively. So it's uh, it's incredibly busy. Uh, and it's all done in Class G airspace, which is, if you don't understand, that's basically common land. So we don't have restricted airspace like you'd expect at uh, East Hill Gatwick. So it's uh, it's very, very intense. But I've got a great team on board there and uh, uh, they keep us safe and sound. And the other thing that people don't realise is, is the imp economic impact to the county. I mean, you know, private jets firing in from Ireland, from all over the world, for Chapman Race Course. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that, obviously, the helicopters being fixed there as well. Um, and then we have all the people learning to fly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we do we do um, private uh, pilot training. So if you just fancy learning to fly, you and I could do that. Ballpark quicker, about £10,000 will get you a, 
on average, we'll get you a, a PPL, a private pilot, a private pilot's license, and then we have our commercial pilot's license. So a zero to hero, we call it. So you, you can typically rock up and within 15 months and about uh, 120,000 pounds lighter, uh, you'd walk away with a frozen, frozen commercial pilot's license. And then you can go and talk to your airlines about getting the type rate in and go on from there. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very busy. Very busy. And, uh I know you're a fellow Welshman like myself, obviously. So what, what would you say is the biggest lesson that you've learned in the short time that you've been here running the airport? If there's one uh, thing that's really sort of stuck a stuck a chord. Yeah, it's uh, it's all about the people. It really is. We are nothing without our people. Um, and that's and it's, it's, it's trying to find that balance. Obviously, we've got to operate as a commercial entity, but um, making sure we've got the right people in the, in the roles, looking after them and engaging with the tenants. That's, uh, that's the sort of I knew it before I started, but it's really resonated over the last uh, eight to nine months, the importance of relationships, I would say. Okay. And the last thing I know for a fact is that you, you did tell us off there that you've got the job permanently as well. Uh, yeah. So as of tomorrow, I, uh, I'm officially on the book. So I took on the role as, as an interim airport director. And um, I'm delighted to say the council have offered me a permanent role as a managing director as of tomorrow, April 6th. Well, congratulations, mate. Thank Without a shadow of a doubt, you've earned it. It's uh, it's great to see the airport back on track and the jewel in the crown of the business community. We'll get those get those letters in, everybody. Okay, thanks ever so much for that. We we are running over, so we're going to quickly go through the pick of the punchlines for this week, please. I'm going to start with you, Rupert. What have you picked out from us? But we'll have to keep it tight. Make it really so. It was the Tesla kind of pothole, um, so dipping their sales and the. Um, is it the, the, the Chinese um, um, BYD uh, company that's um, making um, a cheaper offering, which excites me because actually it gives me hope that at some point I might be able to afford to buy an electric car. So I like that piece. <laughs> OK, thanks very much. Gillian, what have you picked out from us, please? For Pick up the punchlines. Nope, your sound's gone. Sorry, Jill. Right, now you can hear me. Um, Linwood & Co, coffee shops. I lived in um, Australia for 16 years. We make very good coffee in Australia. Um, and I was delighted to read about that we've got um, in, well, in the Cotswolds, um, a number of uh, cafes, but it was, a, it was a bit to do with the signage and whether that had been cleared um, through the planning committees. But I just thought I might take myself off to Morton or Burford or somewhere this weekend and go and drink some proper Aussie coffee. Thank you. Oh. Okay, great stuff. Will, what have you picked up for us, please? So I picked up a story about um, renovating the uh, uh, station in uh, station building in Sirencester, but more because of the talk around uh, making a rail link from Sirencester back to Kemble. And I live in Stonehouse, and again, there's talk about reopening the Stonehouse station, and there's a campaign there, and I think it's really important, actually, that... Um, you know, we, we do these things because we can't just spend the rest of our lives getting everywhere by car. We need public transport to work better and we need more stations. Totally agree. I think it's a great idea. Thanks so much for that. Jason, what have you picked up? Picked uh, up? Picked out uh, Gloucester Rugby. Record um, record revenues last year, 18.2 million. But still um, close to lots of half a million, um, which is quite quite indicative, really, of rugby clubs across the UK. I think uh, um, Worcester Warriors, um, Wasp and London Irish went into administration last year. It's the same story this side of the bridge, Mark, as you know, you follow the Ospreys and the Scarlets. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, these these businesses have got to be commercially viable to sustain to su sustain themselves. So I really much hope it's not the thin end of the wedge and uh, such a such a sorry club has, has lost it. I really hope it's uh, that and all the rest of the club managed to pull themselves out. I think that's the thing, isn't it? Gloucester Rugby is actually really well run as well. It goes yeah. to show how difficult it is to make to to yeah. to, to make money and the, the fact that two clubs went bust. My pick of the punchline actually has to be a couple of days ago where you know there's a, there's an election down the road when you have the big guns coming out and we had Rishi Sunak I met a couple of weeks ago and yesterday or a couple of days ago was Sir Ed Davey rocked up to Gloucester. Hadn't been in Gloucester before. I hadn't seen him in Gloucester before. Always goes to Cheltenham. This time, there he was in Gloucester, pressing the flesh and fair play. The man knows how to work a room or work a garden. And there he was digging up saying, we we're going to weed out the Tories and weed out this. And he had all the right right puns. Last time I met him, he was in the River Chelt or the yeah, was the River Chelt and he was splashing around in poo uh, and uh, in, the, in the sewerage. Of, uh, of the River Chelt, and he was having a good old go at the Tories there as well. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll have the Labour Party leader here very shortly as well. 
we wait and see if we get an invite for that. Anyway, that's it for this week. I'd just like to say a big thank you to our wonderful sponsors, Hazelwood's Accountants and Business Advisors, my wonderful guests. Thanks ever so much for it as well. Thank and you. to you for watching the show. If you like the show, please like, share and subscribe. And remember, it's always all in the punchline. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.